Our next guest is a law lecturer who's written the first biography of one of New Zealand legal history's most infamous figures, the country's third Chief Justice, James Prentergast. The author of the new book, Prentergast, Legal Villain, is Dr Grant Morris. And he says the country's second longest serving Chief Justice was best known for referring to the Treaty of Waitangi as a simple nullity. Dr Morris says while the comment has led to Prentergast being reviled, he was during his lifetime a highly respected lawyer and judge. And his book explores whether Prentergast was as much of a villain as he has been painted, and also, I guess, the revision of history that can occur over time. It raises the question of how historical accounts are treated, especially those that swim against the prevailing political tide in a field. Dr Grant Morris is a senior lecturer in law. He's with us today from Australia. Hi, welcome. Hi, how are you, Catherine? I'm really good, thanks. You make the argument near the start of the book that you think there's a reason there hasn't been in-depth writing about your subject until now. Why is that? I think one of the issues is that there are not too many legal historians in New Zealand to do this type of work. But uh, there's a couple of points, really. One is that many of the legal historians in this area are tied up doing uh, Treaty of Waitangi-based work, and I was one of those uh, at, at one point. But the other one is I think some people who are interested in pursuing legal biography tend to gravitate towards figures which perhaps we'd be more accepting of in 2014, those who were ahead of their times uh, rather than those who perhaps reflected those times. So it's revisionist history, yeah? Yeah, it, it is revisionist history, but it's also, I think, about the, the way in which you choose a subject for biography. Um, someone, say, like William Martin, our first Chief Justice, or Robert Stout, our fourth Chief Justice, when you look at their lives, they probably resonate more with a modern audience than someone like Prendergast, who uh, we would view based on 2014 standards as being ethnocentric and uh, reactionary. For you, why was it uh, the pursuit initially, I think, of your PhD? Why was he a character of interest to you? I definitely wanted to do a PhD, uh, sorry, a, a biography for my PhD, and I liked the idea of, I liked the challenge of choosing someone who was possibly the most well-known judge in New Zealand's legal history for all the wrong reasons, and the challenge of writing a, a thesis and uh, eventually a book about this man and dealing with what he did, exploring a bit more beyond the famous or infamous Treaty of Waitangi decision and placing him in the context of his times. We want to go back to who he was and what his role was because he was certainly in significant roles in New Zealand during times of conflict, during the events at Parahaka. So who was he? How did he get to be in the roles he was, Grant? Yes, yeah, so he came to New Zealand in 1862 from uh, London and practised in Dunedin during the Gold Rush era and was very successful, quickly rose up the ranks until he became Attorney General in 1865. And as Attorney General from 1865 through to 1875, he was uh, in that position during the latter stages of the New Zealand wars. So he was asked to uh, litigate on behalf of the government to provide legal advice in relation to Te Te Kawaru, uh, Te Kuti, and those, that guerrilla warfare that occurred uh, during that period. And then he goes on to be Chief Justice in 1875 through to 1899, so a huge length of time. Uh, and while he's Chief Justice, he's also acting as administrator when the governor is out of New Zealand. And it's that uh, during one of those periods in which he authorises the invasion of Party Haka in 1881. When you look at that track record, it's probably not surprising he's been a controversial figure, has he? As you say, in, in light of where we've been in the last 30 years since the formation of the Treaty of Waitangi, since the land marches, the whole revolution in a way really that's happened since the 1970s and 1980s. But prima facie, he was heavily involved in what some regard as the worst events of the settlement of the, the European settlement of New Zealand. How do you put him in his times, particularly in some of these events, let's say with Pariaka, what was he thinking? What was he doing? Yeah, so I think with the Pariaka decision, 
he was the, if you like, the acting governor, the administrator. There was a, uh, basically a proposition put to him by the politicians. We need to sort out these, uh, as they were thought of, troublemakers and party haka. You're the acting governor. Can you please sign it? And he was basically happy happy to do that, or at least felt that constitutionally, uh, at that point, he had to do it. It wasn't for him to ex exercise independent judgment. So throughout his career, there's always this tension between saying, well, he's making these decisions as, as, a, as a person, as a man, or is he making these decisions as a judge or as a uh, constitutional figure? And can you divorce his own personal views from his uh, constitutional and legal roles? And of the cultural norms and values that he would have brought to that, tell us more about his background uh, and the formation of the views, because this is your central central tenet in some ways, isn't it? Is judge him as a person of the times. What would he have been bringing by means of attitudes or indeed the law itself to these situations? So... His background from England, he was the son of a QC, uh, eventually became a judge. He was what would probably be termed up a middle class and therefore was privileged. And when he came to a colony like New Zealand, um, as we know, men like that quickly rose up the ranks uh, because they had that courtroom experience. They had that experience in the, in the, at the heart of the empire. And so for someone like that, uh, we can understand that he was born into the empire, that he was uh, someone exposed to the ideas of empire and imperialism at an early age. And his first real contact with race relations or cultural encounter comes in the middle of this, what is what had become at that point a vicious uh, civil war in New Zealand. And he reacts to that, I suppose, in a way that he's conditioned to do, which is in a hardline and reactionary way. How harsh did it get? Um, for example, at Parahaka, did he know what would unfold there in advance? Was that inevitable? And was this just hard line, go and deal to them? If you see Prendergast as part of uh, a group of politicians and, and, and constitutional figures uh, at that point, yes, they, they, they knew what they wanted to do. They knew that the uh, power, the political power of Parihaka was a threat to the uh, New Zealand establishment and to their particular government. And so they gently put pressure on Prendergast to sign this proclamation, which he, which he did, and then the invasion took place. So yes, they could have predicted, um, I think, the outcome. Also, you mentioned his dealings with, and he was seen, and you would concede he, would, he dealt harshly, decision-wise, with Māori leaders of the times, Te Tokowaru and, and Te Kuti in particular. How did he deal with them? So there were probably three main ways in which he was uh, in contact or, or dealing with, uh, with the latter stages of the New Zealand Wars as Attorney General. One was that he was the Crown's representative in trials in which uh, figures such as Hami Perry were prosecuted for their role in the, in the uh, New Zealand Wars. He also provided uh, legal advice uh, as the um, Attorney General at the time, and he also uh, played a key role in drafting legislation like the Disturbed Districts Act, which uh, carried out harsh penalties and, and a harsh regime in relation to what was seen as, as Māori rebels. The other big story, and the one for which you said he has gone down in history, this statement, the treaty is a simple nullity. This was from a court case, 1877, when he was Chief Justice. Um, mm. we, we Parata versus the Bishop of Wellington. And it was precedent setting, as many of these decisions were, and as much of the legislation that was passed was to last, in, in much of it right through to the 1980s. Explain the context for that particular court case and the conclusions that he and or others came to. Yes, yeah, so the court case itself was to do with a uh, particular pass of land in the Parirua area and the Māori claimants were basically saying we have native title to this land. So the decision is a native title uh, decision and Prendergast and William Richmond, his fellow judge who was involved in the decision, basically said, no, there's been a Crown Grant that's been issued uh, relating to this land as well. The Crown Grant will trump the native title. So it meant native title 
to uh, a large extent, was pushed out of the New Zealand legal system at that point. Prendergast and Richmond then went on to say, because they had to talk about the way in which the Crown acquired power to do this kind of thing, to extinguish native title like this. And they said, well, it wasn't through the Treaty of Waitangi, because insofar as the treaty purported to cede sovereignty, it was a simple nullity. How controversial was it at the time, the ruling? Not particularly controversial in the settler community. They would have seen it as uh, predictable and the outcome which was to be expected. Uh, definitely uh, was controversial uh, and disappointing for uh, the Māori community because there are a number of pieces of land uh, which were in a similar situation which potentially could have been protected by Article 2 of the Treaty or Native Title and after this decision would not be. I think one really interesting thing that I was thinking about in the last few weeks is that with the recent Waitangi Tribunal report relating to the Treaty in Northland and they say that Māori couldn't have ceded sovereignty in Article 1, they actually come to the same conclusion as Prendergast but using very, very different reasoning, uh, very, very different um, way of getting to that conclusion that sovereignty wasn't ceded through the Treaty. Explain more about that, because that was a significant finding by the Waitangi Tribunal, that in some ways, were it clearly, were it a, a binding body, would have serious, serious ramifications. So explain more about his thinking in this case back in 1877 and where you see parallels on the question of sovereignty with where the Waitangi Tribunal got to a few weeks ago. Mm. So it's looking at this issue in Article 1, was sovereignty ceded as the vehicle through which uh, new sovereignty was ceded from Māori to the British Crown? And the tribunal, of course, says Māori, uh, we're not in a, in a position to understand what the English version of the treaty or what the uh, Hobson and others were asking. They would never have ceded sovereignty as such to Tina Rangatira Tanga, uh, and they would have thought that they were ceding something much less. So therefore, the session of sovereignty uh, in the way we understand sovereignty is, did not happen. Prendergast said basically that Māori did not have the capacity, the legal capacity to enter into a treaty like this and therefore didn't have any sovereignty to cede. So he saw it very much from a, um, a, a position where he said, look, Māori, um, they are not He's looking at sort of scale of civilization. They're not in a position to be able to even give the sovereignty away. So completely different lines of reasoning, but coming to the same conclusion that there's issues uh, in, the, in relation to this Article 1 of our treaty. We'll come back to some of the contemporary cases that are before the courts now, I guess a century or more, century and a half later. But in 1877, how significant was this decision, this statement that he made? This was seen as being a test case for similar situations elsewhere in the then colony, right? Mm. Yeah, so it was It was a very important decision. It was relied on both in terms of the native title and the Treaty of Waitangi for approximately 100 years. And it was only with the New Zealand Māori Council case and then um, Ngāti Apa case uh, with the Court of Appeal that the, the decisions really were finally, we, we put it, it was finally overturned completely. There was a reaction at times, uh, at the time, and, and some of it's very, very interesting. Wiri Muparata, uh, Ngāti Toa leader, as we said, spokesman also, and, and had also served in Parliament during the 1870s, and he said, look, lawmakers are making decisions affecting Māori without understanding them. And that statement echoes all the way through, doesn't it, to where we got in the 1970s and the 1980s and trying to determine the meaning of the treaty as it was agreed at that time. Mm, mm. Yes, and, and that, that point about the, the lawmakers failing to understand whether it's politicians or judges. One of the things I think which really uh, perhaps shocks a, a modern reader when they when they read the We Parata case today is the the type of language which Prendergast and Richmond use. They talk about primitive barbarians and savages uh, and take a very patronising, what would be seen today as uh, ethnocentric or even racist approach, using the terms that would have been in common use at the time. But when you read it as a, as a 21st century reader, um, it's very easy to say, 
you know, who are these people? They must have had a complete lack of understanding of Māori culture. In many ways, they did. Um, and that particularly comes through um, the language they use. One of your key points is that those are values that we today impose on people of the times. And that's not an excuse. I'm presuming the last thing you want to be is an apologist of some kind. You're simply mm, pleading mm. for people for people to assess this person and others of the era in the context of their times. Because what was the entirety of his career? How significant a person was he as Chief Justice and in these other roles? When you take the uh, unpleasant or the unpalatable aspects of what he said and did out of the equation, just how significant was he? He was, in my opinion, probably the most significant legal professional from 1865 through to 1899. And yeah, the the book is, is definitely not an apology, but rather an attempt to take a figure who is known just by part of a quotation and saying, well, let's explore more about him. Uh, let's find out why he made the decisions that he made. And I think that approach to history, a more contextual, more three-dimensional approach, approach to history, especially with these, uh, what might be seen, seen as conservative historical figures, there needs to be more of that done in New Zealand's uh, historiography. Indeed, it's another point that you make, that there's in wider New Zealand legal history, there's not a big catalogue to follow. We have not written or assessed, either reassessed or, or assessed in their own environment, many of these pivotal figures in the formation of a new legal system uh, in, a, in a new settlement. Yes, and uh, there are there are uh, a good amount of biographies of, of the political figures, but there are still some obvious gaps. But in terms of our legal history, uh, there are there are huge gaps in terms of treating these figures. And uh, thankfully, organisations like Victoria University Press and the Law Foundation, which helped me publish this book, uh, have been leading um, the uh, charge to to get more written and get more published about these um, important historical figures. Going right back to what we discussed at the start, for those who are being written about, is there the possibility that perhaps consciously or unconsciously there's a cherry-picking of the stories that fit with a modern-day context or, or, or modern-day readers? I think there is, because when I look at the uh, nature of what has been written, especially about 19th century legal figures, the two figures that stand out of being of most interest to historians and having the most written about them are William Martin, the humanitarian uh, first chief justice, and Robert Stout, of course, was a major political figure as well, but was also considered progressive and perhaps liberal for his time. And yet there are these major, more conservative figures, which Prendergast, Whitaker, uh, even and Joshua Williams, perhaps, who have very, very little um, attention given to them. Is it an environment that we have, academically and otherwise, to write honestly uh, and not through the lens of what might be perceived to be as far more liberal perspectives these days, to write honest history and biography? Or do you see a bit of a tension around that? I think there is a tension around but, I mean, part of this comes back just to the lack of people writing in this area. So, they, you know, when they do choose, they tend to gravitate towards perhaps people that they think they might have liked, that, that tendency of a biographer to, to choose someone that they, they might identify with in some way. I think the problem comes out most clearly in some of the Waitangi Tribunal history, which, having you know worked in that area before, I understand the legislative directives that they have, but they do tend to treat, especially some of the more conservative um, political legal figures, in a quite a two-dimensional way. Um, there's a there's a real richness to the way they treat Māori figures, which is not surprising. But you get this um, very limited uh, approach to figures like Prendergast, uh, Whitaker would be another one, John Bryce. Does that? matter? Does it have an effect on the evidence that goes before the tribunal if there is an element of value judgment being added? In the end, it is the law as it was understood at the time. It was agreements made as they were understood at the time that the, that the Waitangi Tribunal is having to assess. Yeah, I don't think it, it prevents a tribunal 
deciding whether there's been a breach of the principles of the of the Treaty of Waitangi. They can definitely still do that. I think what it does is if you read the tribunal's reports as historical documents, because it does have that, I suppose, presentist approach in some respects, you will get a very particular view of 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 someone like Prendergast, uh, and it will be more more than it's not so much inaccurate; it's just very superficial, one dimensional, or or perhaps two dimensional. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and speaking to Grant Morris, senior lecturer in law at Victoria University, he's speaking to us from Australia this morning, and we are talking about his book on the controversial legal figure, Judge James Prendergast, Chief Justice for many years, and who made some very precedent. Uh, making decisions. We'll talk more about that legacy now. Half past ten it is on nine to noon. And, and indeed, what what is the legacy? Did did the decision made at the time on Parata on the you know the uh, this case and, and the treaty being a sing, single a simple nullity? Did that or the tenor of that carry through all the way through effectively to the seventies and eighties, the creation of the Waitangi Tribunal and an, an entirely different approach to uh, r rights and enti entitlements and indeed a lot of redress. Did it last that long? I think it did. I think it did. And and partly because after the 1877 decision, the settler establishment supported it. They upheld it uh, uh, in terms of native title. It was eventually put into legislation. Uh, the courts used it as precedent. So there was this on going, I suppose, commitment to what Prendergast and Richmond had decided in that decision and, and to their views. And it's only when you get uh, the Court of Appeal decision, the New Zealand Māori Council case in 1987, and then the uh, ultimately the Natiapa Court of Appeal decision in 2001, that you see the, 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 the change that's occurred in New Zealand society and also uh, the complete re-evaluation of, of ideas. That being the case, how do you look at things now, especially having worked in the field, as we said, in the treaty field? What is your reaction to the finding of the tribunal just a few weeks back now, uh, along the lines that, that Māori never ceded sovereignty? It's, it's an amazingly complex and difficult issue, as seen by the reaction to, to that decision, because you've got to, as a historian, work out Given that so much of the debate was oral, what exactly were the the Māori rangatira thinking? What exactly did they think they were signing up to? So, in in some ways, it is a moot point. But another thing that's important to remember is that while the treaty signing was going on throughout 1840, the British were actually putting in place a number of other constitutional measures as a backstop, if you like, to make sure that sovereignty would be ceded through other means if the treaty was to be found a simple nullity. So there there were many ways in which the British could fall back on some of the other measures they took. Eventually, you could argue as well, they they effectively uh, wiped out any opposition by, by force um, in the 1860s. And there it rested until, as we said, the major changes, the new legislation and the, the processes of redress in the 1980s. Mm. It's, again, we are looking at contemporary uh, breaches before the tribunal right now. There's another one just in the news this morning, and this is uh, claimants in the Te Rohe Potai inquiry. And we're talking about whether there'd been a sacred pact, a, a, a sacred pact that guaranteed King Country Māori their sovereignty. Mm. Is this still the tenor of many of the claims that are still making their way through the process, um, that it comes back again to individual agreements and discussions and when, whether there were variations, in this case a, a sacred pact, does this still typify some of what we are seeing even in the contemporary claims process? I think there there is a feeling amongst um, some Māori that mana sovereignty was was never given away, was never ceded, and therefore there is a right, a, a fundamental right, to be able to assert that uh, that sovereignty in, in some way. I mean, Prendergast definitely wouldn't have agreed with the idea that the king country had some kind of uh, individual sovereignty. Where, also, where did things begin to change when it came to his own place in history? Because I think one of the points that you are continuing to make very strongly is that as the mood, the accepted mood and the accepted attitudes of a society 
and its culture's plural change. We look back on historical figures differently. And was there a point over the last decades where those who were writing about him in various ways hardened their views? Yes, definitely. What we see is that he was a very prominent figure during his lifetime. Uh, when he died in 1921 uh, in his 90s, uh, he was still written about, but probably to a large extent would have been not forgotten, but a person that lawyers and, and judges might have thought about. But come the 1980s in particular, with the uh, revisionist approach to, uh, to our history, particularly the Treaty of Waitangi, he is in many ways set up as the symbol of uh, legal oppression uh, because of that quote, because of the fact he had his name to the judgment, uh, coupled with some of the other things we've talked about today, he really does become the most infamous figure in New Zealand's legal history. Are there people who didn't want you to write about this topic? No, no, I cannot think of a of any instance where someone said, oh, you shouldn't be doing this kind of work. I mean, partly the way I see it as a historian is that, yes, it's a controversial figure. Yes, it's a figure who held views which um, many would disagree with today. But as a historian, you can never be completely objective, but you can go in there, you can find the evidence available and you can begin to form your own view uh, provide some context. So I definitely uh, think that the historical community will, you know, will support. They may not choose to do it personally to write a biography like this, but they'll definitely support the the writing of such a work. We cannot end without talking about a uniqueness to the way that you teach law. Thirteen years you've been teaching law. You're very popular for yeah. your all singing lectures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to do it here, but how does how does that all work? <laughs> yeah, that's um, something I I just came up with. Uh, well, not I mean it's not um, something that I just I, I do, but something I came up with about ten years ago when I teach the legal system course at Victoria to the big intermediate year, and it's and it's stressful and competitive for the students. And it was just before the exam, final lecture, and I thought, oh, the, the students seem so stressed. I'll write them a song and and them a song on the guitar and then after that I just kind of kept it going every year and that really uh, difficult part kind of just before the exam I um, make up a song and, 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 and play it just, just to try and relax them a bit and to uh, de-stress uh, if possible. The singing professor or something like that. Yeah. Thanks for your time, thanks so much. Dr Grant Morris, Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Law at Victoria University. He's in Australia at the moment. I do apologise for the quality of that Skype line. It wasn't as good as we would have liked. The book is published by Victoria University Press and it's called Prendergast Legal Villain by Grant Morris.